Our first speaker today is my good friend, and I say this somewhat tongue-in-cheek because we've had many conversations by email, and I have virtually not met but one or two of all of our panel, including Professor Lou Louise Walter, who is from the University of Washington. I am not going to go through anybody's massive CVs as I introduce them today, except to point out just a couple of highlights, which is to say that Professor Walter is a member of the National Lawyers Guild, which we consider to be a tremendous uh, honor in itself. And he teaches the philosophy of language, the philosophy of law, critical legal theory, and human rights, and has done so in many parts of the world, which makes him uniquely qualified to tell us why we are doing this today. Professor Walter? Thank you, Stephen, and uh, welcome to everyone. Um, it's uh, my great honor to be able to kick off this day-long seminar featuring uh, such a distinguished and knowledgeable group of panelists. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity, in a sense, on behalf of all the panelists, of, of thanking the Seattle chapter of the National Lawyers Guild for its tireless energy um, its imagination and its sheer work in, in making this thing happen. I think it'll be a wonderful day for us all, and in particular, Stephen Reisler, I'd like to single out for praise. I'd also like to thank the Seattle University School of Law for having the farsighted willingness to host this event, which I, uh, I think is a, a, a feather in their cap as well. Now, the title that I have given to my portion of the program is The Meaning of the Commons. But in reality, I think the better title for this entire day-long seminar uh, is in the plural. It's The Meanings of the Commons. Because what we're going to be doing today is taking the notion of the commons and looking at it from a wide variety of perspectives. Now, I'd like to make a disclaimer or a confession to you, actually, right at the beginning. Um, I am not and do not offer myself to be an expert in any of the various material or even social aspects of what goes under the name the commons. Um, we have distinguished speakers who are, who will be following me. Uh, thus people like Stephen Tan on American foreign policy, people like Mary Wong, Maggie Chan, Evan Moglin on intellectual property and IT, environmental law and so forth, uh, Laura Nader on anthropology of law. Uh, all of these speakers will be providing you far more useful information than I will this morning. So that leaves me to explain to you a little bit why I think uh, or what I think my contribution can be to this, uh, to this symposium. The thing I do, or try to do anyway, and the thing I love to do is to think critically. Uh, for me, thinking critically is the essence of human freedom. And what I mean by thinking critically is born of my own struggles with what I will call the given world. The world that we have outside these halls, the world we've been raised in, sets limits to our imagination. These limits, these ordinary received wisdoms, these standard ways of looking at things, makes us all into sheep in most of our daily life and makes us vulnerable to being exploited by the powerful. It makes us into subjects of the law and subjects of power in all of its forms. It makes us complicit in our own dehumanization. And especially now, when the world is confronting such a vast array of problems, from global hunger, financial panic, and global meltdown, it's important that we take an opportunity, if only these few hours today, 
to break the grip of the immediate, which strangles our imagination and does not allow us to think and imagine new possibilities to save this world. So my own modest contribution to today's seminar will be to initiate, but not, not terminate, some thinking about this thing, this concept, this social practice called the commons. And more particularly, as the program brochure puts it, I'd like to think about whether there's a multiple and recurring point of intersection amongst all of the speakers you will be hearing today. Now, let's begin our thinking together with really a historical observation. One that Peter Leinbaugh, the eminent historian and author of a wonderful book on the Magna Carta and the Commons, will be more skillfully and, and more, in more detail telling you about later today. But I'd like to set the stage by saying that the notion of the Commons in Anglophone in the Anglophone legal tradition is rooted in a particular kind of historical memory, one that goes back to the feudal era and that took institutional form in two founding documents of the English Constitution, Magna Carta in 1215 and the Great Charter of the Forests in 1225. Now, these so-called charters of liberty are widely remembered today, but they are remembered primarily in only one of their aspects. The aspect I am referring to that most lawyers are familiar with um, in this country is the one that, that drew the attention of the founders of our, of our Constitution. It's the idea that the king, the sovereign, grants people certain rights and puts certain limits on his power. And so in the famous Article 39, we find the origin of the Magna Carta, we find the origin of due process of law, for example, and uh, the idea of habeas corpus. Uh, so what we have there is the notion of the king, anointed by God, putting limits on himself, restraining himself, and granting you rights. Forgotten, or I should say barely remembered, is the other aspect of the Charters of Liberty. It is the notion that the king did not grant, but confirmed certain customary practices that people had been engaging in for hundreds of years and which were under threat. I am referring in particular to the right of the people in common to make use of the forests and the rivers for grazing, for firewood, for basic economic needs in common with others in the community. Both of these charters have extreme relevance to this forgotten tradition. And it's the story of how the tradition got forgotten that needs to be told first and foremost. Now, it seems to me that it's extremely important to draw the distinction that I have just drawn between the state or the sovereign or the king granting people rights and confirming rights that the people themselves take. In the 21st century, certainly in America, we have been beaten up so much by a positivistic conception of the law and of the state, that it's hard for us to think of rights as anything other than creations of people that are more powerful than us, creations that are given to us by the powerful. But the customary rights that were confirmed in Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forests were not given by anyone. They were taken by the people and they forced the king to confirm what they had already taken. Common 
The commons, in this sense, as Peter Leinbaugh so eloquently puts it in his book, is best expressed as commoning, not a noun, but a verb. People actually expressing not a set of property relationships, but rather a form of life in which autonomy and the ability to, to meet basic subsistence needs was something that was in the grasp of the commoners themselves, not something that had to be given to them by a superior authority. Compare that, for example, to the idea, the widespread idea, that welfare in our society is something that is given by the state, controlled by the state, and can be taken away by the state. Now, the commons in this sense, and I, I, and I want to stress this, as a, as a matter of, 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 of law, that, uh, or rather legal theory, the commons in this sense was not property held in commons. This is an important point. It's that the commons in this original sense was not a, a, a tract of land or a forest that the king granted a deed to a group of people, the villagers, for example, to go in and, 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 and root around and, and, and satisfy their basic subsistence needs. It, it wasn't held in common because the very notion of property, private property, is what must be put in opposition to the commons in its original sense, in its original historical memory sense. So commoning as a verb, I guess it's a gerund, um, to common, how's that? To common was to engage in a form of life in which you took your life, your subsistence, into your own hands and did not wait at the table for crumbs to drop from the powerful. This was what was confirmed in the Charter of the Forests and the Magna Carta in their forgotten or nearly forgotten dimensions. Now the point about this, to say, I, I, I think, having stressed this, the importance of this point, is that the commoning, I'm referring to, to common, the people that commoned, and that in some sense were confirmed in their commoning in these charters in the 13th century, their joint cultural memory enabled them to form a point of resistance to efforts to extinguish what they had done, to extinguish their form of life. And when the landed nobility in England engaged upon the process known as the enclosures, which in our terminology would be the creation of private property rights, owing their ultimate force to a grant from the king, there was a resistance possible precisely because people could remember in their lifetime or in the lifetime of their parents and grandparents a different form of living. And so perhaps P uh, Peter Leinbaugh will be talking to you about the diggers, the levelers, others who resisted based upon the memory of an earlier form of life. One that, to stress it again, was, was predicated on the notion that commoning is a form of taking your life into your own hands, not owing your life to the king and the rights that he may or may not choose to give you. Now, I think the distinction that I've drawn between the commons and commoning goes to the very heart of my interpretation, at least, of the meaning of the commons. And its most important salience for us today in a world that is melting is its political importance. If we think of the commons as commonly owned resources, then we imagine begging government, the powerful, the technocrats, for a solution to our problems as we cower in our homes waiting for the flood to rise. On the other hand, if we think of commoning in this original sense of an ungranted, unscripted, 
form of life, then the possibility just begins to open itself for us to freely create the future in common with one another. We are all in it together on this view, and together we can imagine a new future. There is, however, a very great problem with this distinction that I have drawn between the commons as some sort of property concept and commoning as a form of life. In the 13th century in Europe, commoning as a social practice was bred into the bones of the people. It was one of the elements of, social, of the social construction of reality that people did common. They accepted it as normal, as part of life. And so when a threat came to it, they had a memory of something to fall back on. We are in a less fortunate position because the enclosures, the marketization and globalization of this world under the notion of private property and global capitalism has eclipsed the common imagination to such a degree that we've lost contact with this earlier memory, if ever we had it. There's nothing for us to fall back on, or to put it differently, for most people, ordinary people, the only solution they can think of to the failures of the market that are roiling us right now in so many different ways is the market, more market, different market. And so, unlike the, the medieval peasant or the medieval commoner, we, we don't have this cultural memory of a different way of being, or at least the average person does not in the United States. And that presents a problem. What has the market wrought? What has the unregulated, for the last 30 years, the unregulated, back to laissez-faire attitude of the market of private property wrought? This question asks us to engage in the public meaning of private property. Because private property, if we put it up in opposition to the commons as a concept, is not a private concept. It is a public concept. We are in charge of it. Human beings make their world. Human beings make the law. And they go through life reiterating and reinforcing the past and keeping it alive or changing it. The 20th century saw a slaughter of human beings and a slaughter of natural resources and a slaughter of the earth on a scale that is unprecedented in human history. The German philosopher Martin Heidegger refers to the world that we have inherited in the 21st century as a world known as standing reserve or beyond. What is standing reserve? It is a world that in our imagination consists of a collection of objects and things, including people conceived of as human resources. A collection that must be put in a warehouse, ordered technocratically, and managed by those who know better. A world in which even suffering is managed in this way. Let me refer to a recent article by Alexander Cockburn in The Nation. Uh, I, I found this fact particularly interesting as to the way the elite, those who have power and would like to keep it, can strangle our imagination. Um, he referred to 1931 and a, a poll that was taken of the National Economic League, which was a group of elite thinkers and educated people. Now, 1931 is a bad year. Um, this is the beginning of the Depression, and people are out of work, and the stock market is falling. 
and you know, we've got problems. And they were asked, what is the most important problem facing America? And the answer they, give, they gave, actually not surprisingly, was prohibition. Prohibition needed to be repealed, and if one thinks about it functionally, the reason is obvious. If people can be allowed to go into the bars to drown their sorrows, they are less likely to man the barricades, as Cockburn says, and ask for real change. Let me be blunt. Anyone in this audience today who thinks of themselves as a human resource, or who thinks that their education consisted of or consists of investing in their human capital is as far from the primordial notion of, the, of commoning that I've been trying to elucidate as it is possible to get. These are times of great trouble, great crisis, and if I may use the hackneyed observation, also great opportunity. My hope is that today, these brief few hours, in conversation with one another, we can have a discussion and a shared imagination about a new form of commoning, a new form of politics from the bottom, where people get together and imagine possibilities. The signs that this is possible are all around us. Let me close my remarks by pointing out um, something that some of you know already. This, in 1968, and it's an important, uh, it's an important point in any, any um, symposium on the commons, we must give credit where credit is due. Uh, in 1968, a professor of biology by the name of Garrett Hardin published an article in the journal Science that has had an enormous political impact, an enormous impact on social science in this country, including economics. He called it the tragedy of the commons. I'm going to read you what he said in brief so that we can get a sense for this critique. Picture a pasture open to all, he wrote. A herdsman grazing his animals on the land will have an incentive to add another animal to his herd and another, and another. But this is the conclusion reached by each and every rational herdsman sharing a commons. Therein is the tragedy. Each herdsman captures all the benefit from the extra animal, but the cost of overgrazing is borne by all. This argument is the core of those who oppose the commons, or rather commoning and the idea of commoning as a form of social ordering. But let me continue to quote that notorious left-wing magazine, The Economist. <laughs> the implication, this is not me, this is The Economist. The implication of Hardin's analysis that the commons are doomed came under attack early on. When economists be began to look at how systems of commonly managed resources actually worked, they found, to their surprise, that they often worked quite well. Swiss alpine pastures, Japanese forests, irrigation systems in Spain and the Philippines, all these were examples of commons that lasted for decades or hundreds of years. Some irrigation networks held in common were more efficiently run than the public and private systems that worked alongside of them. Though there were failures too, it seemed as if good management could stave off the tragedy. Before he died, Hardin admitted he should have called his article, quote, the tragedy of the unmanaged commons, close quote. I like to think that if I just modify the word unmanaged without eliminating it to say unimagined, that is what we are fighting against today, the tragedy of the unimagined commons. And for me, the most important meaning of the commons is not a pasture, it's not an ocean, it is the shared imagination 
of people in solidarity with one another confronting a world that is falling apart before our eyes. Let us engage on that noble task today, and I welcome you again and wish you have a nice day, and I'll be around here to talk to all of you if you want to later on. Thank you.